can't really quite recall when it first started to appear to be in my mind and my imagination. Something was coming in my direction. I'm not sure if anyone else can relate to this where you just know something's headed your way and you don't necessarily feel anxious or concerned or upset about it. You just know something is headed in your direction. The first time that I actually remember consciously being aware that something was headed my direction, interestingly enough, was when I was watching a television commercial. And it was for an insurance company. And it went something like this. This is Mary. Now, I'm not sure if her name was Mary, but let's just go with this is Mary. This is Mary at the birth of her first daughter. This is Mary when she got her new job. This is Mary, cancer survivor. This is Mary traveling the world because she just retired. Right then and there, it dropped into my spirit. That's going to be me, cancer survivor. The upcoming months, one thing after another would happen. I'd be reading an editorial in a magazine. Interestingly, we are in October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. If anybody's read the paper, or seen the newspaper or commercials, you'll see the little pink ribbons everywhere. That happened, I'd be away on a holiday, breast cancer survivor stories, I'd be watching the NFL, pink tape, gloves on the football players. And slowly and slowly, it just became more apparent, driving down the street behind a bus with a bus board for a mastectomy boutique. And I remember saying to my daughter at the time, that's my greatest fear right there, having breast cancer. Well shouldn't come as any surprise as my mammogram and ultrasound appointment came rolling towards me. I was a little trepidatious to say the least, but I had a good idea what I was going to learn. And then when they, they, um, they ordered the biopsy after the ultrasound, I was like, okay, here we go. One week after that, I get a phone call from my family physician. He's like, hey, Deanna, it's Dr. So-and-so. And I'm like, hi, how's it going? He says to me, well, do you want me to tell you over the phone or do you want to come into the office? And I said, you just did. I don't need to come into the office. I said, what happens now? He said, now you're going to get treatment. Fast forward, my cancer adventure, um, uh, my cancer adventure consisted of, sorry, of um, five rounds of chemo, a double mastectomy, 25 blasts of radiation, and ultimately two reconstructive surgeries. And the reason that I'm sharing the story with you is I just want to share this whole notion of resilience and where does resilience come from. And I remember at the very outset of that whole adventure, and I do call it my cancer adventure, that I determined that I wasn't going to fall down, that I was going to take every step I could, I was going to be as grateful as I could be for every single day, and that I was going to continue to move forward with grace and courage. And when I decided that I wasn't going to fall down and I was going to go into warrior mode, it actually made me fear, feel more powerful. I felt more capable. I felt more competent. And as step by step, as I made my way through the whole adventure, I came to learn that gratitude changes everything. So this photo of me here that I'm flashing up on the screen is me when my hair started to come back yeah. in. And interestingly, and interestingly before, before I lost, I lost my, my hair, I never really appreciated it very much. But when it started to come back, I remember taking this photo, I was sitting in the car in the Fortino's parking lot about to go in to get some groceries, and I take this photo of myself and I said, Father God, if I never have any more hair than this, I will be forever grateful. And thankfully, my hair grew back in. But the, the, the gratitude absolutely changed everything. And this lovely little quote isn't mine, but I will just say that I would love to share it with all of you. I'm so grateful for my struggle because that's when I discovered my strength. And who of us really knows what we're capable of unless we're put to the test? If life is moving along smoothly and everything's happy-dappy, it's less likely that we're going to be grateful or we're even going to be conscious of what it is that we're going through. I learned through the cancer adventure that I was stronger than I ever thought that I could be. According to uh, Sheryl Sandberg, she makes the same sorts of conclusions that when we fully anticipate and we realize and we lean in to our adversities or our challenges or whatever those things might be, and then we practice gratitude, we're far likely to be more resilient, we're more grateful, we're happier, and we're healthier because we know there's that feedback loop happening in our bodies and our minds and our spirits. 
Elizabeth Day, who's a phenomenal English novelist, podcaster, broadcaster, millions of downloads for, fo for folks that follow her, says that we've been sold a lie. That we've been sold this idea that we're supposed to be happy all the time. And that if we're not happy, there's something wrong with us, or we've done something wrong, or we've taken a wrong turn. And she says that's just absolutely nonsense. This is not the way life goes. Life is like surfing. If anybody here in the room surfaces or can hear my voice, surfs, you, you know that you don't stand rigidly on the board. You have to go with the way things are going. The other thing that Day says to us in her podcasts and her publications is that when we share our challenges, we share the adversity we come up against, we share our fears, it takes the power away from them. And it takes that control out of that hand and it puts it back into our hand. And she said, when you actually look to those experiences, those adverse circumstances, the job loss, the miscarriage, which she speaks an awful, an awful lot about, or whatever adversity we come up against, what we can find from it, rather than it burying us, is it gives us something to rise up upon, a, a nugget, some breadcrumb, something to say, okay, that didn't work, okay, I'm gonna try this instead. I dragged this piece of paper around uh, to show my students. I can't remember how old it is, but anyway, it really resonated with me because my work is about resiliency and young people coming up against challenges and so on. And this, the, the paper is all about, or this particular article is about, you know, how do you know you have the right stuff? And according to the researchers, University of California, Irvine, University of State of New York, Buffalo, you know, they followed about 2,000 people around for a few years, and they were trying to determine, you know, how do people get stronger? How do they come up against challenge? And how do they become more resilient? Well, it's practice, basically. It's the same as anything else. You fall down. You get up. When we have babies, and my husband and I, we have four children all together, when our kids started to walk and they fell down, I never said, stay down. I said, stand up, and we pick them up and we move them along. It's the same thing for our mental strength, according to many, many researchers. And the argument is, is that mental strength is very similar to physical strength. You're not gonna get any stronger unless you actually go to the gym, or you do the walk, or you do the work. And it's the same thing for our mental st strength capability and our resilience. It needs a little bit of practice. Whoop, one too many. This is an amazing book that I've just recently finished, and it's called The Coddling of the American Mind, and it's been written by Jonathan Haidt. Oh, it's not showing there. There we go. Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukanoff. And basically what they said is, our young people are not doing particularly well in our culture and in our societies because we've raised them in a culture of safetyism. And what that basically means is, we've told our kids, listen, the world is a dangerous place. Keep your head down. I'll take care of everything for you. You're fragile. You could possibly break. I don't want anything bad to happen to you, so I'm just going to take over for you. And some people call this bulldozer parenting, concierge parenting, helicopter parenting, whatever the case might be. But essentially what this means is we step in and we take our kids' agency away from them. And we do it like this. We go, hey, I'm going to call that teacher for you and make sure you get an extension on your late homework. Or I'm going to call that parent for you and I'm going to straighten that kid out who's not been very kind to you at school. Or, this is my favorite, I'm going to do your science project for you. And everybody at the science fair knows that the four-year-old didn't build a rocket, right? But it makes us feel better because we think that our kids are not capable or we are more capable in some way. We've got this figured out. We know how to make it happen. So what happens is we take their agency away from them, as I mentioned. And what does that mean? We don't give them an opportunity to practice their skills. They don't know how to negotiate. They don't know how to problem solve. They don't know how to address you know, conflict within their peer group or you know, to go to their teacher or their instructor or their professor and say, excuse me, you know, I've, gotten fall I've fallen behind or I've gotten a bit off track here and will you help me? Instead they say, mom, dad, will you call? Will you sort me out? Will you help me? Will you do this? Will you write it for me? Well, what is the consequence? And we're all very well-meaning as parents and caregivers and teachers and so on, but the consequence is, is we never give our kids an opportunity to learn what they need to learn. And then we say to them later, what's the matter with you? 
Why can't you solve your own problems? Why can't you get your work in on time? Why can't you, you know, deal with your conflicts in your relationships? Why are you always fighting with your brother and sister? Why can't you work it out? Well, you know why? Because we told them, it's okay, you go sit over there, you go sit over there, I'm gonna take care of it, right? The other thing that Greg and, um, and Jonathan say is that children are in fact anti-fragile. What does that mean to be anti-fragile? Anti-fragile means you get stronger with the knocks, with the pressure, with the force that you're coming up against. And this, isn't a really, this is a very important thing because it's when young people come up against adversity or challenges or whatever, they become stronger with every single opportunity that comes their way. And this is important because life will always bring us challenges. There are ebbs and flows. So, Brene Brown also says that living your authentic life is key. And for me, this is probably the, the most significant part of this talk for me. I would certainly argue that when you're living your authentic life, you are doing things that matter to you, you are in relationships with people who matter to you, you have goals and mm -hmm. dreams that are, you know, your goals and dreams, and when you fall down, you're more likely to get back up again. If you're doing something that you don't want to do, you're living in an environment that makes you unhappy, you're in a job that makes you unhappy, you're in a relationship that makes you unhappy, or you're doing things just because someone else said you should, there's a far la less likelihood that you're actually gonna get back up again when things go sideways. So, here are a few things that I've learned through the cancer adventure, through being a parent, through being a university professor, and looking at the material. Number one, it always blows my mind, these notions of entitlement that you know, we seem to have about being here on this planet. You know, some of us believe that we should never have to struggle, that if something bad comes up that, you know, it's, it's not okay or, or that we've been wronged in some way. But life is like that for all of us. It's, it's simply not true. And what happens with us is when we feel entitled, we are less likely to fall back, you know, to get back up again. And, you know, the bottom line is we're all here together. We're all here to serve one another. No one is better or less than anyone else, and we need to work with each other to get through all of it. The other piece that I'm here to share with you is life is a time-limited offer. I have peered over the edge of my mortality. I did not know if I was going to be alive to see my children grow. My youngest was eight when I was diagnosed. And so I understand that this is important, that the today, the here and now is really important. When you go to bed tonight, we're gonna to be here one last day. And some people find that a little depressing or maudlin. I don't see it that way. I feel like every morning that I get up, this is a blessing, this is a new opportunity to do something new and fabulous. The other piece is, is that I say to my students all the time, Father God gave us gifts. We all have gifts. We have goals, we have dreams, we have desires, we have drives, something that makes us want to get up every day. And the job that we have is to get up in the day and figure out how to use those gifts and continue to be grateful for the fact that, you know, we have today. Other piece that I discovered is that we worry too much. We worry about and my students tell me this all the time. I don't know when I get out of school if I'm gonna find a job and if I can't find a job, you know, am I gonna get married? Am I gonna have a partner? Am I gonna have a life? Can I afford a home? Will I be able to travel? How about if I'm gonna be able to retire? And it's like, okay, kids, everybody take a deep breath. We only live, you know, one day at a time. You worry about things that are likely never going to happen. Just enjoy yourself a little. And I find that some people are some, or young people somehow are a little bit reluctant to be happy or to enjoy themselves for fear that, you know, it's too premature that they should just kind of stand down. The other thing that I learned is it's always today. It's always today. It's never tomorrow. Tomorrow's a concept. It's good to plan. It's good to consider what's happening, but it's always today. We don't live in tomorrow and we don't live in yesterday either. And so living in regret and remorse and sadness because of things that are lost or gone or left behind it has no purpose. Yes, it's important to reflect, but it's also important to move on. And I think it's also really, really important to not hold on to judge, uh, grudges. If something didn't work out, you leave it, you move on. And I think it's also extremely important to not hold grudges against ourselves. 
you know, if we feel we failed in some way. We didn't fail, it just didn't work and we're moving in a new direction. Live your authentic life. Yes, it's important to acknowledge how we were raised, our families, our teachers, our instructors, our community members, people who have brought something to our lives to help us be who we are today. We, we didn't get here on our own, that's for certain. That said, you don't live anyone else's life and they don't live your life. And for somebody to look at you in the face and say, no, you shouldn't use your gifts. No, you shouldn't sing. No, you shouldn't start a business. That's not realistic. That's not gonna work out. How could they possibly know? Because you're the only one who has the dreams inside of you. Those gifts are yours. And I say to my students all the time, have the courage to use those gifts. And if the job doesn't work out, or if that relationship, or the business, or you need to make some sort of adjustments, you learn from that, and you take it and you move it forward, and you bring it into a new opportunity. A new door will open, a new day will begin. And finally, gratitude changes absolutely everything. When you wake up in the morning and you know that you're blessed to live another day and you have people who love you and care about you and you have something that matters to you, there's purpose. And when there's purpose, there's a greater likelihood that when you do come up against challenges or struggles, you're gonna say, well, that's okay, that didn't work, but I still wanna work in this field, I still wanna be a filmmaker, I still wanna be a pharmacist, I still wanna be a scientist, or whatever the case might be you'll continue to move forward. And at the end of the day, all I can say is this, I'm so grateful for all of it. And by all of it, I mean the blessings, the beautiful people I've had in my life for the struggles, because all of it has brought me to this place and I'm stronger than before. Thank you.